Excellent. Thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, no. Yeah, very good. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I'm super excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. Um, my understanding is we have about 45 minutes together. So a lot of material. Um, I don't have too much context on the spectrum of, of what context folks have in terms of blockchain, in terms of us. So I'm going to keep it high level. I'd love to share a bit about our business, uh, about our journey, about how we are using blockchain, where we are today, where we plan to go. And then I'd really like to turn it over for some questions and have a dialogue. So shall we, shall we jump in, get started? Yeah, sure. So you, you have something to present so that... Um, Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. So are you open to probably if some participants jump in to ask any question as you present or you want to finish and so we can have time for questions later? Yeah, why don't we, why don't we get through a few slides um, and, then, and then as quickly as possible, we turn it into a dialogue as opposed to, to just presenting. Love the questions. What I'm going to do first Mm -hmm. with your permission is give you some background on uh, on what we're doing what problems we're solving so we're called cobai and we are simplifying shared home ownership can everyone see the slides all right yeah i can see it awesome so my name is matt holmes i'm co-founder and ceo and this is pam hughes on this slide who's my my co-founder and my mother so she's a C COO. We, our backgrounds are largely in banking, finance, and real estate. So to give you a little context, we started co-ownership, sorry, we started Cobuy to unlock home ownership and wealth creation. Um, this was just over five years ago now. And if we look at the problem, we're gonna talk in context of the US, but a lot of this can be generalized uh, for many countries and regions around the world. So here in the US, three in four renters would rather own their home. Most people aspire to home ownership, except there's a huge problem, which is that home price appreci appreciation has been increasing at a faster rate than, than wages and incomes in the US. So for a lot of people, the prospect of owning their own home is increasingly out of reach. And if we take a step back, we look at housing, there are economies of scale. So what that means is on a per bedroom basis in the US at the national level, a three bedroom on a per bedroom basis, a three bedroom home is 56% cheaper than a one bedroom. So there are massive economies of scale and teaming up really amplifies your purchasing power and makes home ownership more affordable. So Let's, let's think about that. What does that mean? Well, that means two or more people who are not married to one another teaming up to buy and own a home together as a primary residence. So at least one, one of those folks is going to live there. I'd like to define some terms before we go forward. Uh, first, when I talk about co-buying, what I mean is buying a home with one or more friends, family members, or partners. So anyone who isn't just your spouse, although it could, could include your spouse. And that results in co-ownership uh, which we also call shared home ownership, which means owning real estate, real property with one or more friends, family members, or partners. So co-buying and co-ownership are just like home buying and home ownership uh, outside of the context of a, of a nuclear household with, with only one married couple uh, as, as owners. Takes all different forms. So basically everyone else is potentially a co-buyer. Um, in the US, uh, in all of North America, uh, South America, Africa, Asia, Europe. This is actually pretty common throughout time. And there are, over the last five and a half years, we've seen that there are a lot of drivers, a lot of reasons that people decide to buy and own homes together. But if we kind of stratify those in order, the top three would be financial reasons. And we just talked about how there are huge economies of scale and how teaming up to purchase and own together um, reduces the financial hurdle, but also social reasons. And there's an array of these, but we could group them into at the highest level, financial reasons, social reasons, and then the desire to own one's own home. And um, this, is, this is something we see across the world, not just here in the US. So 
how did we get into this? Why did we start a business to make it simpler, safer, and more affordable for people to team up and buy and own homes together? Because we attempted it ourselves. So back in 2015, I moved um, back to the US from London, where I had been working in investment banking for, for about a decade. Uh, and I decided that I wanted to buy and own a home with my mother, my stepfather, and, and my girlfriend at the time. And just like that slide I shared with you, we were motivated by, by both financial reasons and, and social reasons, but we wanted to buy and team up to buy and own a home that we would all live in uh, as a primary residence. And between the group of us, we had almost a hundred years of real estate and finance experience. So we thought, you know, how difficult can it be? Turns out it was very difficult. Um, and the reason is that everything around the institution of buying and owning a home. So the very institution of home ownership itself and all of the systems we've built here in the U S and again, we can generalize this around the world to do with home ownership actually serve this, uh, outdated notion that all households or the vast majority of households are comprised of um, a traditional nuclear household. So a married couple at the core. We found ourselves that if you look at co-buying, which is really just the start of co-ownership, which can last anywhere from a couple of years to, um, to the rest of your life. So 30 plus years, there are a lot of moving parts. There are a lot of things to consider. There are the financial aspects. There's the ownership in, in the legal structure. Um, then you have more of the interpersonal side of things. So the roles, rights, responsibilities, how do we make decisions? The, the two, the three of us, the four of us, what have you. Um, and then the, ad, the administration and, and finally the risks. So what happens if somebody dies? What happens if someone is delinquent in payment? What, someone, what happens if there's a disagreement that we can't reconcile? So we found personally that there are all these moving parts uh, and buying, in a home, buying and owning a home is for most people, the biggest investment that, that they'll make. So a lot of moving parts, a lot of complication, a lot of inefficiencies because the home buying process and home ownership really cater to that traditional nuclear household to a married couple or a singleton. And when I say that, I mean the legal institutions surrounding home ownership the financial institutions that, that make it possible, uh, tax and accounting regimes and others. So to solve this, to make it easier for more people to team up, to buy and own a home, um, we, we built Cobuy and we started with, by building a co-buying platform. And what that was, was a site where friends, family members, unmarried couples could come together and we would guide them through the process start to finish. We would connect them and involve all of the businesses and uh, relevant in professionals in the residential real estate value chain and make it really easy for people to go through this complex process start to finish. And so we developed a system um, to provide some structure here. And it started with helping, let's say a group of three friends who wanna team up to buy and own a home together, helping them plan and build consensus Who's going to be involved? What is each party bringing to the table? What are the shares' golden goals and expectations? And we'd help them confirm readiness before getting a joint mortgage to purchase their home, um, going through the actual transaction itself, so search, negotiating, transacting, and then structuring ownership, and finally protecting um, against all of these risks, which in a multivariate sense, uh, the sample space of things that can go wrong is increased, particularly because the legal frameworks and the financial frameworks around home ownership are catering to that traditional nuclear household. Over the course of our business, and we've now worked with thousands of co-buyers uh, in multiple states, we've had demand from co-buyers from all 50 states in the US uh, and from three continents now, seven countries. But what, what our customers have really realized and what we've realized is that Co-buying is just the start. So we started with this platform to tackle co-buying, um, but that's just the start of co-ownership. Think of it like a marriage. Success isn't determined by, determined by the altar or, or the courthouse signing the docs. Success is determined over the full life cycle. What we do know with co-ownership is eventually it's going to come to an end through, um, and that can be amicable or not amicable. So, you know, through death, through transfer, through sale, Co-ownership is going to end, we know that. So whether it's two years or 30 years, we don't know. But we found that 
helping people manage co-ownership over the full life cycle is what's really important because co-ownership or shared home ownership is similar to a business partnership. When I say that, let's look at some of the, the characteristics. You've got multiple parties, just like a business partnership. You've got joint investment of financial capital, of social capital, meaning your relationships are on the line. You're putting your time and your energy into this. So there's joint investment, just like a business partnership. And then you've got shared interests. You've got shared liabilities. You're sharing in the risk and you're sharing in the rewards of so the upside, the downside. Um, so in many ways, co-ownership is like a business partnership, except you're tagging on living as a service. That means that just getting over the line on the purchase really is just the start. It, the success of co-ownership is gonna be determined over the full life cycle. Uh, and we have a lot on the line. We have our relationships, we have our financial capital, um, and we have our home. Because of that, winging it, just going through this process without any sort of plan, without any sort of structure is an awful idea. It doesn't mean that there aren't instances of friends or family members who have co-owned a home where things didn't go well, but there's just too many moving parts, too many things that can go wrong. At best, it's very inefficient and we're opening ourselves up to a lot of these risks. Um, at worst, um, there can be bankruptcy. The asset can be encumbered. We can go to court because we have a disagreement about money and we didn't think about how we were going to handle a number of scenarios. So we don't want to wing it. The stakes are very high. Um, on on the success side, things can go really well. We can see return on our investment. We can see uh, our relationships further strengthened and we can feel a sense of well-being and, and access homeownership sooner than we might have otherwise. Why blockchain? I, I wanna share a little bit about our journey into blockchain and in, in, into Algorand in particular. So um, I was actually introduced um, about a year and a half ago to this blockchain known as Algorand, which you may or may not be familiar with, uh, by a friend, a former, a former customer, a uh, former client from my investment banking days uh, out of the Middle East, who um, shared with me kind of why he was interested about blockchain. And, and it, I, I learned more about uh, distributed ledger technology and how it's being applied. And, and right away, what stood out to me given my background in, in finance and then what we're doing here at Kobai. And we, we had already come to this realization that to really help our customers at scale and to help as many people uh, access co-buying and co-ownership is a viable path and accelerated de-risk path to home ownership, that what we need to do is help them manage co-ownership over the full life cycle. So when I was introduced to this concept of how distributed ledger technology and some blockchains in particular m introduced the immutability of data. Uh, this really struck me because immutability of data is just massive for multi-party asset management, which is what co-ownership is, uh, as we just kind of looked at. Um, having that definitive source of truth around all of the things that go into co-ownership. So the terms of the arrangement, the structure of ownership, the decisions that have to be made, the predetermined risk handling, if any, the payments, etc., is really beneficial for everybody involved. It increases transparency. It increases efficiency. Uh, at the same time, it's decreasing all of the things we don't want. So we're de-risking um, every aspect of co-ownership. We're reducing the manual labor that's involved in terms of the things we have to do because we're able to automate some of these routine processes and tasks. Um, we are reducing the scope for human error. We are reducing the uncertainty, which provides peace of mind. And ultimately we're reducing the cost. Um, and we're also through all of this establishing non-repudiation. So what this does is this is making co-ownership an accelerated and devious path to home ownership, which in the US and much of the world is the number one way that folks build wealth. So this is really important for us. And when we when we came across Algorand and blockchain, we were really excited. Um, why Algorand? I actually watched a, a video. Um, I think it was Sylvia McCauley, the, the, the founder of Algorand on Lex Friedman. So if you guys haven't seen that, I would recommend checking it out. But what struck me was Silvio's ability to convey these complex concepts 
And a really beautiful solution or set of solutions, a toolkit, as, as it were. And that's really how we view Algorand uh, on the technical side. But he was able to, to communicate how this toolkit could be used for all kinds of real world use cases. And this was really music to our ears because our jam is helping people access homeownership and real wealth. Um, so we dug in and quickly learned that Algorand is, is scalable, it's, it's secure, it's blazing fast. Um, so on the technical side, there were a lot of reasons, a lot of things that appeal to us. But when, when we look at kind of the vision of the world as well and the ecosystem, we felt like there was really strong alignment and we, and we very much feel like there's very strong alignment. As folks who were, didn't come from a blockchain engineering background, what we found is that this is also a very in, inaccessible blockchain, that there are amazing resources, not least the developer portal. So if you guys haven't checked that out, I highly recommend doing it. Um, we digested and devoured really all of the testimonials, all of the use cases, um, and we were able to quickly learn which parts, which, which parts of, of Algorand, which features would be most relevant uh, to our business, to our customers. But it was just really easy to, to dive in. Um, if you look at the range of SDKs, and then if you look at the community as well, so on Discord, on the message boards, on the developer portal, extremely strong. Um, and Technically, um, fast, efficient, very low cost, so fractions of a penny to, to engage in a transaction. All of these were very appealing. So now we're gonna turn it over to what we're doing today. We, um, we talked about how we started at Kobai by tackling the purchase side of, of the home ownership journey for co-buyers with our co-buying platform. Um, we also shared, I also shared how we realized that we needed to help our customers tackle a different and potentially more meaningful part of the co-ownership lifecycle journey, which is co-ownership itself. And that is because success is determined over the full term. And so we've built a solution on Algorand for all of these reasons called the Shared Homeowner OS. And it is an operating system and it's really an all-in-one tool for friends and family to plan, structure, and manage their shared home ownership or co-ownership over the full life cycle. So all of these disparate moving parts, these different aspects of co-ownership that we've been talking about, what it does is it ties those together in, in a, an intuitive interface that is today accessible as a web app and leveraging Algorand. The outcome is for our users, there's a lot of things they wanna do. And I think from a product development point of view, it's very important to point out that we're not here to build features, we're here to solve problems. The macro sample set of, of co-owners, like what are they looking for? Co-buyers and co-owners, well, they, they want co-ownership to be simpler, safer, lower cost, and ultimately for it to pay dividends, for it to, um, deliver a return on their financial investment, their social investment. So if we take a step back, like let's look at the flow at the highest level for the shared homeowner OS. Um, it starts, we could break it down into three, three bits really. So that starts with onboarding where co-owners are users. Those can be friends, family members, unmarried couple, two couples, uh, sign up to the platform. They form a co-owner group and they verify their IDs. Once that's taken place, then we take folks through governance. And if you're familiar with blockchain protocols or any of their governance structures, then this will make sense to you. But this is, this is a stage where the users, the co-owners in the group, they co-create terms and structure and an operating plan for their co-ownership arrangement, for shared home ownership. And then they codify that via agreements so a co-ownership agreement and a memorandum of agreement, which they digitally sign so that those agreements are executed and then stored. From then we say internally that they're in the steady state. So that's when they reach the steady state of multi-party asset management. And we help them perform 
and solve a lot of the tasks that that they need to achieve over the over the course of co-ownership and eventually um, exit co-ownership. What are we doing at uh, in in terms of blockchain? Well, really, what we're doing is bringing co-ownership on chain. You hear a lot about tokenizing real estate. Um, there are many reasons that tokenizing real estate, or rather tokenizing title, which conveys ownership of real estate in, in many countries around the world, is, is not feasible in uh, a regulatory sense. But what we're doing is we're bringing co-ownership on chain. So we're creating a unified representation of co-ownership that ties together all of these disparate moving parts that we talked about and representing that um, effectively with the co-ownership nft so we're using an algorand standard asset and for each instance of a co-ownership group we create one such algorand standard asset with a, a total supply equal to the number of co-owners or users in that group but it's unique to the group and then we tie all of these different aspects of co-ownership around that co-ownership nft around that asa and that is the representation, that is the glue that binds us together. In the wild today, all of these things live um, kind of out in the ether, disparate. Most people don't have a plan for co-ownership. It is very difficult to attach who's involved and in what capacity to legal structure, documentation, uh, to the property. And this hinders all kinds of things. This makes it difficult to get the financial products and services that folks need. This means that in the event of any risk scenarios coming to fruition, that it can be difficult to prove who owns what, what's taken place. So this idea of immutability and tying everything around a co-ownership ASA is really, really, really helpful, really powerful, and unlocks co-ownership as a viable path to owning a home talked about the three stages and in just a sec I want to turn it over to you guys talked about the three stages onboarding starts with some pre-screening questions to confirm fit we collect user inputs from our from the folks in the co-ownership group to inform the path forward so this is a dynamic dynamic flow we verify their IDs on multiple levels um, folks then subscribe and and the, that's where the blockchain magic happens under the hood we can go into this a little bit, little bit deeper if, if folks want to, but that's kind of what the onboarding flow looks like. The Algorand magic, this is what I want to focus on. We're creating Algorand accounts for individual co-owners. We're also creating a group multi-sig account for the group. And what this allows us to do is create that ASA, distribute it to each of the, the co-owners in the group, and create a, an Algorand smart contract, create and deploy. Um, and the users then opt into that group ASA. The ASA is distributed and frozen. And the users opt in to, to the smart contract. And we're gonna use that ASA, which is a representation of the co-ownership group. Every time there's any sort of consensus operation or action by a user on the platform with regards to the co-ownership arrangement, the smart contract is going to verify whether or not the respective user or users, so co-owners, hold that ASA and whether or not their identity has been verified, which is a prerequisite for moving forward. So this unlocks the power of documenting all consensus operations going forward, whether that's to do with digital signatures or in the near-term payments, um, and eventually to create something called out outcome-based governance which is where we will use smart contracts to programmatically deal with a number of scenarios that may come, may come to fruition over the course of the co-ownership life cycle. Governance uh, is, if you think about it, kind of like a shared home ownership wizard. So we're taking people through all of these topical themes to do with co-ownership. So ownership structure, payments, expenses, finances, policies, which are kind of more the day-to-day -day running of the co-ownership agreement, of the co-ownership arrangement and end of the household itself. Um, and then exit strategy, we're taking them through, we're helping people get on the same page about discrete decision points. And that culminates 
And so this is just a screenshot here. That culminates in the signing of agreements and uh, the digital execution of agreements, which are then recorded to IPFS and the Algorand network. And we use IPFS just because large amounts of metadata uh, don't tend to live very well on blockchain layer one networks. So if we look at an agreement, an agreement is an important part of this whole process, but the executed digital agreement is, is just an output. What we're really helping people do with governance is create and maintain a framework for operating co-ownership, which we said is like a business. That is something that's an ongoing process because circumstances change, preferences change, and co-ownership like a business, like any sort of organization or not-for-profit is a living entity, is a living organization. From the steady state, from the user's perspective, the steady state is, um, signified by the dashboard. So from the dashboard, users, co-owners, after they've executed their co-ownership agreement and gone through governance, can access a document vault where all of their important files, receipts, their co-ownership agreement as well, and all of the versions of all of these things are stored. We are going to be helping these folks, co-owners, um, create reserve accounts and execute and automate multi-party payments, which is really important if we think about the monthly mortgage. So most, most co-owners will take out a mortgage together to finance the purchase of their home. And if you think about the monthly mortgage, the loan servicer has to receive payment every month, that monthly mortgage payment from one financial account, not three or four. So automating multi-party payments can be really powerful for the co-owners and also for the businesses involved for the, for the loan servicer. And on the, on the other side, even further, the investors and the underlying debt obligation. We're gonna help folks with manage all aspects of, of their co-ownership arrangement um, with in terms of property events. So kind of like a, a co-ownership calendar, if you will, that ties in to payments, that also ties in to administrative tasks. So we know that we may need to re-up on our insurance policy. We may need to have, um, a technician come in and service our appliances every six months, every year. This will be able to be managed from the property events calendar. We are going to help folks connect to legal services and also facilitate the exit. So from this dashboard, they'll be able to see some of the KPIs around their home, starting with the home's value. These KPIs will help inform a lot of the decisions that they have to make. And if you think about the fact that your home may be in, in a, in economic downturn, the value of your home may be depressed versus where it was a year ago. That might push you towards deciding not to sell at this time. Maybe even if you wanted to sell your home, you might choose to wait a little bit longer. So giving people this, this information and some of these KPIs around their home from the dashboard will be really cool too. Finally, co-owners will be able to add or remove a co-owner and then update their agreements. So we talked about how governance is, is a living process. And um, we make it easy with just a few taps to say, to change and build consensus around some of the key determinations that inform that co-ownership agreement. And when that changes, they'll be able to, in a few taps, execute a new co-ownership agreement. So I'm going to cut it here um, and turn it over to you guys for questions. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. This is very exciting and uh, really thank you for the taking us through this and also I hope everyone on the call has got opportunity to learn from your business model and uh, especially on the part of the blockchain. So I guess uh, we can start um, the session of the questions uh, from the group. So I would suggest that, of course, if you have a question already, please open up your mic or first raise up your hand. If you are not comfortable speaking, you can still write your question to the chat box. So let's see if from the group, if someone is ready with a question and to ask Matt. So we can give him a flow or her. So Yabiba. Hi Matt, really thank you for 
uh, very enlightening talk. Um, one of the things that while you're talking, the question in my head was, so how, how do you enforce some things? Like if it is a digital money, you can enforce it. And then if it is also like if when in a situation where government officials are not going to accept some of these contracts that are written, but the contracts can enforce either a lock in the document or, you know, kind of distribute some other valuable items that are digital. But, uh, but then all those can be overridden, like if they, if they go now in the court, like how can that be, you know, like if they now there is a conflict, you know, how can this help in resolving in actual court or, you know, is that, is that not something um, that would happen or is there, is there any way of enforcement either digitally that takes value from one to another or that some of these items can be used in the court to win a legal battle. So, you know, how, how, how is that sorted? First off, thank you for your kind words and, and for the question. This is an excellent question. Um, we have been doing this for almost six years, Pam, my co-founder and mother and I, and we started as the user, we started as the customer, which is helpful to my mind. It's not essential to build a successful business, but it's helpful. We are deeply passionate about the customer's problems, and we've been doing this almost every day for this time. So we've developed deep domain expertise. To answer your question, yes, regulation. We have to think about regulation. So without domain expertise, it's tough to implement things in a way that will hold the test of time in terms of the courts. And you raise a good question, like what happens um, about, with enforcement? Like what happens if you've helped people execute an agreement that's no good? So understanding what the key drivers of an agreement are understanding the bounds of the law. So we're not attorneys, nor do we pretend to be over the course of Kobai. We've actually worked closely with attorneys and helped all of our customers. The vast majority of our customers involve attorneys when oftentimes they wouldn't because it was too difficult. There was too much of an information asymmetry that they couldn't find the right attorney or the cost was too high. So we're breaking down barriers on the, on the purchase side. We've broken down barriers on that front, but learning um, and gathering, really building the domain expertise around what you're doing helps you be able to navigate challenges like this. So we cannot eliminate risk as Kobai. And as with the shared homeowner OS, we, we cannot eliminate risk for three friends or two lovers or a group of family members who are deciding to team up to buy and own a home over, over let's say, a, a 10 year period. We can't eliminate risk, but we can help them stratify that risk, understand that risk. We can educate them and help them build a plan for success and then help them manage the day to day. And if those risks do come to pass, help them manage them in the most intelligent way possible. So having no plan is a bad plan is like one of our core theses as a business. Having an agreement written down and executed doesn't itself solve anything. So moving forward, we are involving contract, smart contracts in a more meaningful way beyond um, some of the introductory ways we're doing today. So eventually let's say there's three, three friends who co-own a place and one person doesn't pay their monthly mortgage payment three months in a row. If they had agreed to a mechanism for how to deal with that, let's say that that is that anyone who doesn't pay their mortgage three, three times in a row is docked uh, X percent in terms of their ownership interest in the property. If we had agreed that ex ante and built a smart contract and deployed that smart contract and automated the way we deal with some of these risk scenarios, then the enforcement uh, would be automatic, first off. Second off, if we did that in a way that was in line with the law and regulations, um, then this would also be a deterrent for bad actors or bad activity. If I know that there is an automatic programmatic way that my not complying with our agreement is, is punished effectively or dealt with, then I, I'm probably going to try and avoid that outcome. And so enforcement 
automation of enforcement, these are really big themes. Understanding where the law is, where regulation is, is really important. I think that's part of one of, that's also one of the reasons that we haven't from day one tried to build out the, the version 10 of the platform. Regulation, the regulatory landscape is constantly evolving and it's, it's still relatively infantile here in the US. So starting with some of the key problem sets of the users, where we know that we can steer clear of any regulatory issues um, is how we've chosen to approach things. And fortunately, there's so many things that can be solved with blockchain, starting with consensus, digital signatures. Um, so we're fortunate in that regard. I hope that answers your question. No, I mean, I think it, it does, I, yeah, it does give um, a level of yeah, layer where some things that are solved are being solved. I think I, I actually enjoyed that element of like, where this is much more of a management platform. It is not the regulatory platform. And then over time, you can go to a regulatory platform, probably as time allows, as well as also the technology allows. Um, and I mean, I, I think I will, I will leave the equations, but again, I don't, it's kind of, I don't want to take more time, but is there no digitally controllable mechanisms that either it's by locking some kind of documents or by integrating in the house some component that legally can be uh, you know taken as 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 entity for example if you own part of the key or something that you you would be able to you know legally enforce something like kind of that way but i think you know that one i will just ask later no no that's that's later. cool yeah i i like yeah. this it's quite specific so um first off yeah with with one of the main ownership structures that that were help giving access to to our to our customers um or helping them understand is one of their options rather uh, it is a trivial operation if everyone agrees and documents it to change the relative ownership interests in terms of percentage between co-owners. So one lever we have at our disposal is if we help co-owners digitally execute agreements and understand these agreements, then a, uh, a lever at their disposal for controlling um, bad behavior or non-performance is the ownership interest in the property, right? So programmatically, that's a lever that addresses what you're asking about. Second thing is, is we're also going to be using multi-sig accounts um, and USDC, to, uh, which is a digital dollar, to help people create on-chain joint checking accounts, if you will, in a sense. It's kind of a proxy for joint checking accounts and a proxy for joint savings accounts, which we call a reserve account. So a multi-sig wallet can be used to pay that monthly mortgage payment, but a multi-sig wallet could also be used and funded in USDC as a reserve account or savings account. Um, so once we look at USDC and the introduction of USDC, the dig digital dollar, then we can get very programmatic in terms of finances about risk event handling and, um, and how we can automatically control for unwanted events. Thanks. I have one more question, but I'll come back after other people have a chance. Cool. Yes, Mohammed, go ahead. Yes. So oh, thank you, Matthew, for the wonderful uh, presentation. Um, but uh, I have a follow-up question for Yabi. Question. Um, the, if I'm getting that wrong, please correct me. So uh, Yabi uh, suggested or oh, thought that uh, uh, that Kobai should have some sort of um, um, decision or uh, power over the contracts. So isn't that uh, going to cancel one of uh, the biggest or the most valuable blockchain uh, which is decentralization of power. So 
I'll, I'll answer that and let me know if I got it wrong. But um, Kobai, so we're not starting out as a fully decentralized application, as a DAP, as it were. And there's a lot of reasons for that. First off, we didn't come to blockchain because purely of the, based on the ideal that we think everything should be decentralized tomorrow. I'll tell you, personally, I don't believe that that's feasible overnight or necessarily that it's something that we want in the absolute sense. So that's my first answer to your question. Second is um, Kobai, whilst we're, we're not launching as a dApp, we have set up our architecture and with tending towards a, a dApp um, as, as part of the roadmap on the product side. If we launched this a dApp today, um, there are a number of risks there, but I think the biggest one is that we would put a massive limiter on adoption. Um, a, we don't want to make it a prerequisite to understand blockchain and to be able to use a wallet and use dApps to get the benefit of our product and our platform. So a lot of the blockchain stuff's going on under the hood. We're not keeping it secret. We're explaining folks, we're explaining to folks like what's going on and how it's working. But we think that in order to get mass adoption and to see the utility of blockchain realized for you know, broad swaths of humanity that we're gonna have to make using blockchain easier. And starting with building solutions to real world use cases like we're doing um, with intuitive interfaces that don't necessarily require a high working level knowledge of, of blockchain. Mohamed, I guess your question has been answered very well. Yes, thank you, Matthew. So let's, let's Absolutely. Hear, let's hear from underneath the next Michael. Underneath, I got your hand on. If you can speak. Oh, oh, sorry, I was on mute while I was speaking. So. So thank you, Matthew, for taking the time to answer our question. My Absolutely. question is, uh, uh, my question is, once uh, uh, once a smart contract is deployed, it's, uh, it would be very difficult to like modify it and change it uh, whenever like uh, a new uh, business problem occurs or, or whenever well, so, like we want to like embed something in that smart contract. So how? Uh, was like robust uh, your smart contract previously? And uh, did you face any uh, problems that uh, requires you to change your smart contracts uh, of like, uh, the, yeah, to well, what are you doing your business? This is uh, my question. The second question that I have is, uh, how do you handle uh, when uh, like co-buyers wants to sell their uh, assets uh, uh, like in the middle of uh, like maybe before uh, paying out uh, their mortgages or uh, yeah uh, how do you how that uh, how does that uh, is handled yeah cool thank you for the questions I'll take those in turn so yeah you're very right and this relates to the last question uh, Kicking things off, launching the shared homeowner OS with uh, on the spectrum, like not fully decentralized, means that we have more leeway in terms of making changes to, to, to smart contracts or changing how we approach solving any of our user pain points, changing features, changing functionality, et cetera. This is why we didn't want to kick off with um, tons of very complex smart contracts performing all of the solutions that we believe are required by our users. First off, the market, the marketplace and your users teach you what they need. And so I think that feature creep is real when you're developing a product and starting simple and building from there is the best way to go. Now we have the benefit of over five years of of customer engagement which is huge 
But I would caution um, to anyone looking to build products, meaningful products that, that solve real world problems to approach things by implementing a, a waterfall approach, trying to solve everything from day one. So to answer your question at the base, starting simple um, and especially when it comes to smart contracts, which are going to need to be audited for security reasons, starting simple is really key. So that's how we're approaching things without getting too deep. I want, it, I want the response to be meaningful for everyone. Um, second thing is what happens if people want to sell um, at any point during co-ownership? Well, this is actually what happens. So we want to we want to help people understand the different ways that co-ownership can come to an end through full partial sale, transfer, or death. And that can be um, agreeable or that can be in a strained scenario where you have a disagreement between two or more co-owners. If people understand this, this sample space of possibilities and then implement best best practice procedures for how you deal with each one, um, then what we find is things go a lot more smoothly if and when any of those scenarios comes to pass. I should point out that let's say like there's three of us and we co-own a place and in year two we decide, you know what, we want to sell. Uh, maybe I've met a new romantic partner and I want to get married. And you know, maybe the two other co-owners got job transfers. If everyone is um, on the same page, then there's no problem. So, you know, sometimes things do go right as well, is what I'm saying. Um, but having a plan for how to deal with what happens if somebody dies? What happens if somebody gets a job transfer um, is, is very helpful. So we've had a number of co-owners dissolve one way or another their co-ownership arrangement anywhere from one to now, I think four years. I've been doing this over, over five, I said. So um, for all of our past customers so far, things have gone really, really well. Eventually, we're going to see cases that are strained because, like I said, we can't eliminate the risks and we can't guarantee perfection. We're not striving for perfection. We're helping people set themselves up and for the highest possible likelihood of successful co-ownership across those key dimensions that we've been talking about on all these slides. Um, so we can't eliminate risk, but we can help people optimize for outcomes. Thank you for the question. Thank you for answering. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Adonet. Uh, before I move to Michael and uh, Etina, Matt, there is a question in on chat box. So I think if, if you can read it. Cool, yeah. Uh, then. How do you go about assuring doubtful potential clients that this contract will be available and valid in over 100 years, like a backup? if system crash or fail? Um, great question. First off, we have a very well-established idea customer profile. And when I say ideal customer profile, our customers are groups. So they're kind of like a business. So we have some parameters that, that we've established is what, what are, who are our target customers? The people who, we want to deal with and who we're able to propose the most value to in line with with our company strategy and to that end go trying to um assure doubtful customers is not really part of what we do and it's not that we, we do want to convey our value propositions to the market um but for folks who don't fit the parameters it's it's as a startup, it's simply not a good idea to chase folks who uh, who don't fit your idea customer profile, if that makes sense. So I want to deal with the other part of your question, which is, um, you know, will the contract be available and valid in over 100 years? Um, let's distinguish between smart contracts and um, the co-ownership agreement. Um, the co-ownership agreement, yeah, part of the reason we're doing this on chain is because it is recorded to IPFS and to the Algorand network. So 
the existence of the co-ownership agreement transcends us. Um, co-owners also download a copy of it, which has a signing certificate that lists all of the relevant Algorand network data um, and document data in terms of dates, of participants, users, um, and their Algorand public addresses and the multi-sig public address. So once again, we can't eliminate risk, but compared to a scenario where you have a, a written agreement that's printed out and maybe at best put in a safe, um, there's definitely a huge aspect of immutability. So we're improving on the status quo here for sure. Okay, great. Uh, Mika, with your question. Hello, Matt. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, uh, good out here. And uh, it was a nice presentation. I loved it. And uh, I think Web3 have more uh, use cases than this. We have to discover a lot in the future. And my question is, uh let's assume that one of our uh, uh one of the buyers or one of the person in the contract or in the agreement decides to leave which i have seen you describe some exit facilitation mechanisms so what would be the fate of the smart contract since uh smart contracts cannot be uh changed once they are deployed. So it's a basic nature of smart contracts, right? Like they cannot be uh, manipulated or changed once they are deployed to the network. So how would you handle uh, with the remaining number of uh, persons who agreed to continue? And how would you handle the exit mechanisms of that person? Great question. In a nutshell, there's the taxonomy of possible Exit paths is too great for me to tell you how we handle each one here. And there are some that probably, if you think about it, probability weighted exist, but we don't even know of. In, in a vacuum, there's an unlimited number of possibilities. Uh, in real life, there's a finite set of ways that this often goes. So those are, those, those are the scenarios that we help people uh, plan for. Um, in terms of the smart contract, if the group composition changes. So if there's four of us and I leave and someone takes my place or doesn't, um, our platform simply creates a new smart contract. Um, and so the ASA that is created for the group and the core smart contract that helps validate each individual's membership in that group are unique to the composition of the group. That means if someone leaves and someone else joins or someone leaves and doesn't come back, the group composition has changes, has changed. So we um, create and deploy a new smart contract for the group and create and distribute and then freeze uh, a new co-ownership group ASA or NFT, if you will, uh, with distribution equal to the number of users in the group. Thanks, that answers my question. Yeah, I think people get stuck too often on the fact that like, you know, immutability and with in terms of smart contracts means that there can never be changes like of course there can be changes there's there's tons of even dapps who you know will launch new versions of their platform so you can you can build a new you can always build a new you just have to think programmatically about like how do you account for how you're doing things and this is why you want to be very intentional about platform design and about architecture and frankly from the beginning, tackle a smaller sample set of pain points and solutions. Then there's less to untangle um, and, and you can iterate more quickly. All right, um, Etina. Uh, yes, uh, hello. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I, I have a question. Um, uh, you have mentioned that you, you're keeping a uh, kind of a central power, so you are not deploying this as a DApp, uh, uh, central, completely decentralized. Uh, you know, it's, um, 
sorry. Um, so, um, I mean, and also mentioned before that, uh, yes, this uh, blockchain is very new and also uh, like uh, the regulation, there is no regulation is very infantile uh, at, the, at the moment. And so it could happen in the future that uh, this field will be regularized more. So there is some kind of uncertainty there. So how do you argue if I said uh, that, why are you using blockchain then? Um, um, I mean, maybe you could do all of this without the blockchain while you're involved, involving it. Um, yeah, that's my question. That's a really good question. So I can also, th this is how I like to think about it. I could also fire up my Pen Pentium 486 with like Microsoft Office 95 and um, run a funding round for my startup, you know, create a pitch deck and a very old version of PowerPoint dialed up to the internet with a very slow connection. But just because I could do something with archaic tools doesn't mean I should do something with archaic tools. So blockchain offers a toolkit that helps us accelerate and magnifies our ability to successfully like deliver solutions for our customers. So what are those? Um, there's different ways of thinking about it. There's, we can look at how we use the feature set, the core layer one feature set. So with Algorand, we're leveraging Algorand standard assets. We're le leveraging Algorand smart contracts. We're leveraging rekeying. Uh, we're leveraging Algorand accounts, multi-sig accounts. Um, you can also look at kind of what are you like, what parts of the solution are better with blockchain? So ID verification is one, consensus and digital signatures and execution of agreements is two, uh, automating routine tasks through leveraging smart contracts, three, um, the rapidity of payments and the fact that um, no, third party is depended on is, is four, especially if we think about automated multi-party payments. It's very helpful to have immutable records around who's contributed what, when payments were made. Today in the real world, people are using at best spread, spreadsheets, sometimes apps like Splitwise, they're sending people ACH transfers um, or using Venmo. Um, but this is this is really fractured. This is really granular. There's a lot of scope for human error. Uh, it also makes it difficult to introduce anything programmatic. Um, and so I hope that gives you a little bit of flavor, but blockchain gives us an awesome toolkit to help us deliver value to our customers where they need it most. All right, thanks, Matt. I guess, Etina, you've got the answer for your question. I hope so. So if there is no one with the question, I can move with my questions. So I want to just understand on the business side of, uh, of, of Kobai. So just, just for example, what one question that I have in mind is like, you know, there is a possibility of someone to own um, a house after completing the mortgage, but there is also the feasibility of the cobite that you can force for someone like after paying a certain percentage that you can still allow them to own it, even if they don't continue like paying mortgage. Do you have that option or what happens if they stop paying at a, a certain high percentage, let's say 95 percentage of the payment? Yeah, so um, I'm gonna give you the, the answer to that. Once again, w oftentimes when we talk to students or sometimes venture capitalists, people wanna know what happens if this, and the sample space of, of those type of questions is so great that it's not productive to have a conversation about that. What I can tell you is that in the wild, people are either not 
co-buying, or if they are, they're doing it very cowboy style, ignorant of many of the risks and generally not planning for any of them. So our bar as a company is not to help people identify every single risk and eliminate every single risk. This is just not a good way of looking at it. If that's how we thought as, as a species, we kind of like never make progress. So what we try and do is say like, okay, what, what are the possible things that could go wrong? And then help people understand those and then offer them best practice solutions and let them choose how they want to deal with that. It's not on us to be in. So in this sense, as a business, we are very much decentralized. We're not taking a position in the property. We are a partner. We're not a, we're, we're we're not a counterparty in, in a trade. So we don't have, Kobai doesn't have exposure to the asset, the ownership or the liability. We're not selling them a mortgage. And this is very important because it allows us to be a, a neutral third party facilitator. So if somebody doesn't pay, whether that's a recurring payment or a one-off, first off, how do you know that they were supposed to pay? So that's where we're starting is helping people define that plan and then maintain that plan. Because if you, if you don't have a framework that's explicit and executed in an agreement that says, okay, these are all the costs and this is how we're divvying them up. And this is the regu regularity of intervals. And this is the mechanics of how that payment is going to occur. Then it becomes very fuzzy about like, well, you should have paid. Well, why we didn't agree that prove it. Right? So we're starting up front with the planning when you start and you look at like proactive strategies to define, crystallize and execute how we're gonna handle all of this, the likelihood that things go wrong or that there's disagreement plummets. So we're, we're not like remedial doctors, we're helping people steer clear of these problems. That's been very, very successful on the co-buying side so far. And that also attracts a certain type of customer. I want to caveat that with education is one of the things that's most important to us. So we are constantly sharing the knowledge that we've acquired through doing this ourselves and then through helping, working with thousands of people to do this. We're constantly synthesizing and sharing that knowledge with all of, all of our customers and prospective customers. And that goes back to that question earlier, like how do you deal with a skeptical client? Like we don't, our job is to like educate the market to constantly test our hypotheses. One of them is that a ton of people want to do this. Uh, we found a lot of support for that through primary and secondary research, but then like, how do we reach the people who want to do this on of their own volition and who want to do it better, who want to save money, who want to protect themselves, their home, their relationships, and who are willing to follow our lead on that. Um, so these are all really good questions. And I hope that kind of, gives you an insight into how we're thinking is oftentimes we want to think, how do we solve like every small problem? How can we guarantee to our customers that if this happens, everything's going to be fine. Like we can't, but what we can do is stratify all of the problems, risk weight them in terms of probability, look at the magnitude of how bad that is if that happens, and then push that forward in the flow in terms of the order of operations that we're helping people solve and and really highlight the the big hairy stuff and then give them some some ways to avoid the big hairy stuff so we're we're taking a preventative approach as opposed to a, a remedial approach and that is in line with being decentralized in terms of a neutral third party we're not the judge we're not the jury we're not the law but we are the best possible path to doing this a better way and avoiding those nasty outcomes All right. Thanks for shedding some light on that. And uh, so, sorry, we run out of time. I guess uh, the group has got opportunity to learn most from uh, Kobai and uh, um, including myself as well. So I guess if there is no other question, we can wrap up. But as uh, I have it at Ten Academy, we of course send a thank you note. It's mostly done from the group uh, team. I mean, the participants. So I will ask one from an academy uh, just to say a thank you note 
I, we understand that this is, this is an important time for you to dedicate to us. So we really appreciate. So someone from 10 Academy trainees who is willing to give a thank you note to Matt for his presentation and time. Please uh, unmute and go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Matthew, for your amazing presentation and uh, uh, for taking time to answer our questions. So uh, it's been a, a, a pleasure to have you here. We've actually got the chance to work on a digital certification system using Algorand blockchain. And uh, I, I and me and like my teammates, all of us actually uh, found it very interesting uh, platform, especially Algorand's blockchain. And I am uh, very much uh, intrigued uh, you're using like such a real world business, like using blockchain to solve uh, problems, a real world problems. So it's very uh, inspirational. Uh, I, I, I heard, I also heard you say that uh, you're not here uh, as a business, you're not uh, there to uh, solve problem. Uh, you're not there to like create features, but to solve problems. So uh, I just, uh, as an engineer, uh, we tend to like focus on like building features upon features and uh, like neglecting that the real world problems. I think this comes from the place where you're actually uh, the you're uh, yourself were the uh, part of the problem, and you want to give solution for. Uh, the problem that you're in. So I think that it came from that uh, place. Uh, and once again, on behalf of 10 Academy trainees, I would like to uh, say thank you very much and good luck with your uh, work and uh, all your business endeavors. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate all of all of your input, your mind share, your questions. Uh, I'm going to throw my email here on the chat. If, if anyone has any questions, happy to answer those to, to the best of my ability. It's a big subject. I think the, the, the thing I can leave you with is um, there's a lot of information out there. Some of it's good, some of it's bad. Um, I, myself and my business partner, we see blockchain is offering tremendous possibilities, particularly with regard to leveling the playing field and um and building wealth so happy to to share any resources if anybody wants to get in touch my emails on the chat thank you guys i appreciate it all right thanks matt seems like someone doesn't want to go with the, doesn't want to go with the question and the answer is michael so if you raise your hand up like twice if you can just sub, jump in and quick so we wrap up please do so it's fine to do so, I guess. Otherwise, uh, we close it this and we thank you much for this time. Thanks. Bye guys, cheers. Thank you guys, I appreciate it. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.